On the 11th of October 1984, at the height of the miners' strike, an IRA bomb exploded at the Grand Hotel in Brighton. The Conservative Party conference was in full swing. Margaret Thatcher, working on her papers at two in the morning, narrowly escaped death. Although she survived, the impact of the bombing had a devastating effect on the Conservative Party and her own administration. The air was full of cement, cement and dust. And by that time, there was an eerie silence. I was still in, in evening dress because even though I have to do my speech that night, I always have to break to go off to the benevolent ball of the agents and then come back. So I was still in full evening dress. Dennis had just pulled a suit over his pajamas and we'd managed to quickly seize some of our clothes to take with us and have a quick look in the, in the bathroom, which was the room worst affected, uh, which had uh, some plaster down and the glass had come in, which would have been very nasty had one been in the bathroom at that time. We left together and then we went down the main staircase and we saw the debris and we saw the whole front of the building full of rubble and the whole entrance full of rubble. I knew as soon as it happened that it was a bomb and uh, my wife and I woke and I said that was a bomb and uh, the roof, the ceiling began to collapse, we saw the chandelier swinging and there was a progressive collapse and we were tipped down, we didn't know how far, uh, under a shower of debris. I doubted whether I was going to survive very long because I knew that I was bleeding extensively. Um, but uh, after a while, uh, we heard these noises and uh, began to shout and made contact with uh, Fred, uh, the fireman. Um, I don't think I've ever held on more strongly to uh, another man's hand than I held on to Fred's hand, which as he was wearing heavy asbestos or something, gloves too, made it slightly ridiculous. Um, but I was intent on not letting go once I'd got hold of another human. Norman Tebbit suffered severe injuries. His wife Margaret was left permanently paralysed. We went straight to the police station, where gradually people gathered together. Thank you very much. Our worry is uh, whether there's anyone under that rubble, because I don't know whether you've seen it, but it's pretty awful. We then learned that it had been a bomb inside the building and not in a car. And they really rather wanted me to, to get me back to Downing Street. And I said, no. I'm staying here. Life must go on as usual. And your conference will go on. The conference will go on. The conference, all right, all right, John, the conference will go on as usual. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. I remember that they took us from the police station in Brighton to a police college where we were to stay the night. And the, the speed with, with which we went was horrendous, screaming through these country lanes, not really knowing where we were going. Eventually we arrived at this police college and we were allocated rooms, coffee was laid on and uh, everybody was terribly worried about what we'd left behind in Brighton. We just went into the bedroom. What could we do? We just quietly said a prayer, and I said the Lord's Prayer. It was somehow just a little comfort in that most distressing day. And then we tried to sleep, because the new day was almost there. 
the Prime Minister was determined not to be defeated by the terrorists. The conference had to continue. We had all these people, you see, who'd come out of the, the Grand Hotel and they, had, they were wearing bath towels and dressing gowns and they clearly were not fit to go and spend a, a day in a, in a conference. Margaret Thatcher said, business as usual, get the thing organised. So we had to get them clothes. Alistair McAlpine had the brilliant idea to get onto Marks and Spencer's and say, please open up your shop, 8 o'clock in the morning. We want to come and get some clothes so we can start the conference. So all of them decked out very smart in Marks and Spencer's clothes. We walked onto the platform and we started at 9.30, precisely. For all the robust show of unity at the end of the Brighton Conference, the IRA's attack left a deep and abiding scar on the body politic. The injuries to Norman Tebbit and his wife were a particular blow. Tebbit had been a long-time ally of the Prime Minister. His removal left Margaret Thatcher without a key supporter at a crucial time. But at the time, the blow was not just political, it was emotional. Of course, a pall hung over us. I went off to see the hospital and to see the patients there. I saw there John Wakeham, who had not yet come round. Um, his wife had been killed. We'd lost Tony Berry. I saw Norman, I scarcely recognised him because, of course, as he'd come out of the rubble, he, he looked simply terrible and he'd just come out of the operating theatre. I saw Margaret Tebbit in the intensive care unit. And I'll never forget. She was conscious and she said to me, Margaret, I can't feel anything below my neck. You can best describe it that when you shoot someone with a very heavy caliber pistol, uh, fine, it, it's not actually the bullet that necessarily kills them, it's the shock of the bullet hitting them. And the, uh, and the shock of this, or they killed only a, a small number of unfortunate people, it um, uh, had a profound effect on the Tory party. In the wake of the bombing, Mrs Thatcher seemed to lose her political touch. In the months that followed, her government faced crisis after crisis. She was forced to shelve policies. U-turns became common. It became a time when uh, we stumbled over small things and were stopped from doing some of the things which I wanted to do because you couldn't go ahead. The timing just wasn't right. Uh, for example, uh, we got, uh, this was the period when we came into Western, this was the period when we wanted to privatise British Leyland uh, and we were stopped uh, uh, from doing that.